What's up everybody? Is anybody else thinking that maybe the video games hobby is getting a little bit too expensive for us? Well, it's getting a little bit too expensive for the games industry as a whole. Developers are starting to feel the squeeze. Good morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you are in the world. Nick Banks, as usual, for all things PlayStation 4. Let's have a little chat about this, shall we? As we all know well enough by now, the video games industry is getting bigger and bigger year on year, and it's actually worth globally now 99.6 billion US dollars, with a little bit of help from the growing industry that is mobile gaming. Although the difference is with mobile gaming, uh, it's a lot more cost effective to create um, a very undemanding piece of software where people expect an ongoing marketing plan of microtransactions but with the big AAA titles that we're playing on our games consoles it's a different story altogether and just how long can this hungry gaming beast be sated for before exploding like Mr. Creosote? On this video, which you may or may not find concerning, let's take a look at uh, all of this money that rolls around in the undercurrent of the consumer base, only to be recycled aloft in the upper stratosphere of the game's development studios. So the first thing to bear in mind with this situation that I'm going to go into is the existence of VR. I'm having a great time with mine, so is everybody else who owns a PlayStation VR, so I hear it's doing very well for itself. But the issue that it is for games developers is that it has put them in a brand new, sticky and expensive situation. With the arrival of PlayStation VR, uh, the gaming industry is poised to explode even more. But that said, it's poised. It's not quite there. Games developers are now left with an interesting quandary. Do they leave all of this intimidating new tech behind with the game that they are now making? Or do they get their eggheads prepped for figuring out how they're going to elaborate on this strange new tech that they've not had to work on before? This drawing board dilemma is going to be uh, a, a decision on a huge gamble for many developers. Will they create a great and original idea for VR for their new game that's going to be available to both owners and non-owners of the headset, or will they make the game VR exclusive? Are they going to waste time, money, staff salaries, electricity bills and more on an idea that maybe just won't earn them profit? Maybe they won't make a VR game that is as functional as people might expect, and of course it is likely going to be their first time giving this a go. And with all these questions, how on earth is any developer not going to be pulling their hair out at the prospects of both keeping up with the industry and not going bust? Well, apparently it's not really a prospect that's very intimidating to Rockstar Studios. According to the all-seeing eye of the internet, apparently VR and potentially AR, augmented reality, is going to be coming to Grand Theft Auto 6, and this would complement the idea that they are actually pushing for a first-person experience by default. Obviously they had a little fiddle around with that with GTA 5 when it released on the current gen consoles. And GTA 6 is currently penned in for a release date sometime around 2018. But what makes this really odd is that they're fiddling around with the, all, the, all of this new tech, which obviously is going to be very expensive for them, and despite that, they want to release the game in 2018? There's usually half a decade between GTA titles. And then on top of all this, Rockstar also need to take care of the marketing plan for Red Dead Redemption 2's release, which is going to cost them a shed load of money as well. Oh, and by the way, if you're as mental about Red Dead Redemption 2 as apparently most people are, there is a little rumour circulating right now that it's going to be released October 2nd this year. Hmm. Click on the link in the description below to see what I'm going on about there. So the point that I'm trying to make here with Rockstar is that they're dealing with all of this stuff which is costing millions and millions of dollars um, and on top of all that they've lessened the release window massively for their next big game GTA 6 and it just doesn't quite add up to me, it doesn't quite make sense. How are they going to afford all of this? And frankly it kind of whiffs a little bit of developers trying desperately for consumer demand that just will not wait. The uh, the gaming consumer base is becoming more and more impatient as the industry progresses. And if you think I'm getting a little bit carried away, um, there was an article on Neurogadget that kind of feels the same way in their report. They believe that the GTA 6 development process currently is facing more financial issues 
than actually making developmental progress. And another great example of developers becoming too ambitious for their own good, spending too much money for their own good, is Metal Gear Solid V. A fair while back I actually wrote a piece on my website exactly what the heck happened to Metal Gear Solid V. And I've mentioned several times since, if you've played the game and finished it as well, I'm sure you will agree that the final moments of that game feel more like a thrown-together montage than the epic conclusion to the saga that we had invested so many years of our gaming career in. And when a game is developed for more than seven years, spending upwards of $80 million, then of course the publisher, in this case Konami, is going to start raising questions as to whether or not the final release is going to turn a profit once it's on the shelves. And when things like this tend to happen, it tends to make a little bit of a mess of things, as seen in the last few chapters. Well, I shouldn't say chapters, because we only got chapter 1, I think, in Metal Gear 5. Well, the last few moments of Metal Gear 5. And we've seen a similar issue as well, more recently, in Final Fantasy 15. This one was an even bigger ball for profit margins to get rolling. This one took a decade. And I had a funny feeling that Square Enix hit the panic button, just the same as Konami did with Metal Gear Solid 5. Did they suddenly start to worry that Final Fantasy XV was just taking too long? Uh, the, the, that Square Enix was spending too much money on Final Fantasy XV and that when it released, those profit margins weren't quite as fat, they weren't quite as wide as they would have liked for such a massive title as Final Fantasy XV. Now, it's with these two titles that we have to start wondering, if a game takes too long to make, will it be shit? Well, no, not necessarily, because thankfully Metal Gear Solid V and Final Fantasy XV turned out pretty good in the end, all things considered. But in the case of Duke Nukem Forever, it was a steaming pile of shit, and there's little doubt left that after spending so much money for so long, developers end up stepping into the kind of territory where they have to work extra hard, where they're suddenly given this deadline that they need to work towards, a deadline that they weren't expecting, and all of a sudden they have to get creative with how they're editing their game and splicing all the bits together to make an experience that doesn't feel jarring by the time it's on the shelves. Over the last decade within the games industry, there are lots of little indicators to see that developers are trying to claw back as much money as they possibly can after all of that expenditure creating such a lavish, technically fancy video game. Insteps DLC, season passes, ultra mind-blowing mega whopper editions in fancy shiny cardboard boxes, and whether you love or hate being dangled upside down for the pennies, it was a necessary next step for the developers, otherwise they'd sink. But they don't want to sink, they want to swim, don't they? And of course developers' mouths need feeding too. I personally don't like DLC, anyone who has followed me long enough uh, will agree with that, uh, but recently, whilst looking at the wider picture of the games industry and how it's functioning right now, Sadly, as I say, it was a necessary step. Although we are getting to a point now where developers are... they Well, they've given up being clever in marketing and clawing back all this money. And now they're just... they're not even being subtle. We had the whole controversy with Infinite Warfare and the Modern Warfare remaster that came with it. You could only play the remaster if you bought the full game. You could only play the beta if you had already pre-ordered and put money down on the full game. Um, and all of these things, are, they're, they're just very money-grabbing. But to prove a point, Resident Evil 7 is out now. And uh, very sneakily, what Capcom wanted to do was release a collector's edition that cost a hundred quid. Um, there were lots of things in there, like a replica of the mansion, a 20th anniversary art book, alternative inlay for your game box, a USB stick. But regardless, all of these things did not add up to being worth £100, in my humble opinion, anyway. Thankfully, in the end, uh, a large shipment for the UK of these things uh, got damaged, so maybe that was a good thing in the end, because the collector's edition didn't even come with the game. And when you think about it, there is a fairly insidious side to all of this, a sneaky, sneaky side. How many people would have pre-ordered that collector's edition expecting the game? Even the advert that says alternative inlay has an image of the inlay in the shape of a game box. And these people would have been extremely disappointed, thankfully, with that mishap um, with, I think it was with Amazon or um, just the big providers that bring the games into the country. I think it was on a larger scale, yes. Um, after that mishap, then these people who made the pre-orders were refunded. 
Um, so they dodged a bullet there, really. But can you imagine, you know, Capcom are probably aware that people are under the illusion and rightly so, that if they order a collector's edition on something that they will get the game with it. And this is ridiculous, this is obscene. If you order a collector's edition of the Harry Potter movies, then you're not going to expect a little cardboard box with some wonky ones in it and no DVDs. You expect the films, because it's a collector's edition of the films, for goodness sake. But I'm getting worked up again, as I said earlier on. These are just desperate practices, and they're, they're very uh, telling that the games industry and games developers are trying very hard to claw back as much money and profits as they possibly can. I think they're in trouble. Um, and another thing as well, it's nothing to do with PlayStation, uh, but Scalebound just got cancelled on the Xbox One, and if you were an Xbox person that was a really big deal, because Scalebound was up on the level of exclusivity as Uncharted 4 is for us. Um, and in the end, a lot of the staff who were working on Scalebound, they got let go for just for a month um, due to, inverted commas, too much mental stress on the project. And then they came back into the studio, and then they were all told by the big boss, actually, we're going to pack it in. This isn't working. So think of all the wasted money there. And there could have been a financial issue there as well. So I'm not too hot on the idea of having to buy our games from digital marketplaces. And the reason I say that is because the only way now that games developers can really um, focus on making decent money again, or at least the money that they want to make, is with a digital marketplace by eradicating the pre-owned game stores. And don't get me wrong, again, I'm not a fan of that. I love pre-owned game stores. They make gaming more uh, accessible and more budget-friendly to people like myself and other people who perhaps aren't rolling in money. However, as far as the games developers are concerned, you know, you will only get a sale on a game or a special offer on a game if they dictate it, if they say so on the digital marketplace. And um, something that ties into this particular topic is another video that I did um, theorizing about a one-platform future where there will only be one console and there will be no discs and it will all be digital. Um, and sadly, it's looking like the games industry is leaning in that direction if it intends to survive. If it doesn't, then I think we're looking at a big video games recession soon, something the likes of which the games industry has not seen in the entire of its existence. Something's got to give somewhere, but where is it going to be? Here's hoping everything turns out alright, guys. But that's my two cents on the games industry as it is at the moment, folks. Uh, hopefully we, we won't have a video games doomsday, but time will tell. And so I'll wrap it up there. If you enjoyed this video, then by all means click the subscribe button down below. You can also follow All Things PlayStation 4 on Facebook. If you just type in All Things PlayStation 4 on Facebook there, it'll pop up on the search. And you can keep up to date with everything that I do with the website as well. Or don't. It's entirely up to you. Until next time, I'll see you on the next video for All Things PlayStation 4, guys. Peace.